Hello. I'd like to use uh, the web lecture format to cover some of the topics in uh, Zimmer and Emlin's chapter 14 on macroevolution or the long run. This fits into the scope of our last class on the past, present, and future of evolutionary biology. So our field, evolution, has historically been divided into two parts. Microevolution, that's evolution occurring within populations. It's essentially Dobzhansky's definition of evolution as changes in gene frequencies in populations. And macroevolution, changes above the species level. The origination, diversification, and extinction of species or groups of species. One place to look at this is in beetles. And if uh, we could say anything about, and this is a famous quote from J.B.S. Haldane, if we could say anything about the mind of the creator, it's that she had an inordinate fondness for beetles. Because there are at least, and, and this number on this slide is actually a low one, uh, something on the order of 3 million or more species of beetles, not 30,000 or 300,000. There are a lot of beetles. And we think that their close association with plants, most of them are herbivorous, and the most specious groups of beetles are all herbivorous. They eat not just every single, nearly every single plant, but they eat multiple different parts of each plant. And they, in pretty much any plant species, you can find a specific beetle that at least eats two or three different parts of it, from the roots to the different parts of the stem, to the leaves, the flowers, the seeds, uh, all different parts of plants. And this leads to millions and millions of beetles. So part of uh, our discussion today is about biogeography, the study of the distribution of, of species across space and time. This is a field coined by the, one of the co-discoverers of evolution, that's Alfred Russell Walls who discovered it at the same time as Darwin. He was perhaps the greatest field biologist, at least of the 19th century. After 10 years of collecting beetles and butterflies in the Amazon on his ship back home to England with crates uh, and crates and crates and crates full of samples, his ship caught fire and sank. He was rescued, but he lost uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of uh, samples. It was an inordinate fortune he would have made. What did he do after this loss? He turned around and went to Indonesia and started the same collection there all over again. And, and in his work he saw more different parts of the world than anyone else. And he noted that there were different groups of species in different parts of the world. And we name a, a biogeographic dividing line, Wallace's line, that separates Southeast Asia from Australia and Papua New Guinea, where there's a bit of very deep water, and the birds, the plants, the mammals all change between those two regions. So biogeographical patterns, the fact that we see different groups of species in different places, are explained by dispersal and vicariance, the same factors that ultimately drive most speciation. Dispersal is the movement of populations from one region to another, and vicariance is the formation of geographic barriers to dispersal. So we covered vicariance in our speciation class, but it's worth reviewing how it leaves a distinct phylogenetic signal. So if we look at marsupials, uh, sort of pouch-bearing mammals, uh, we see that they have their their speciation patterns are a mix of vicariance and dispersal across the southern continents of the world, uh, and then recolonization of North America from South America. So biogeography is a multidisciplinary part of evolution and ecology that explains the distribution of species, and really all of this is about history, dispersal, and vicariance. So part of understanding macroevolution is understanding the interplay between speciation and extinction, where we can describe diversity as originations minus distinctions, and that gives rise to new diversity. So regions that start with lots of species and have more forming and few extinctions will end up with the most new diversity. And this is something that we can calculate over time using the fossil record using alpha as the origination rate and sigma as the extinction rate, or sorry, omega as the extinction rate. Okay, so if we use 
origination and extinction in the fossil record, we can look at the history of life on Earth. And we can indicate when new lineages when new lineage arose from splitting of previous ones. So over time, there have been three uh, named faunas: the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and modern uh, faunas. Uh, sometimes the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, the Mesozoic, is lumped in with the modern. And there are differences in the number of species. It's also worth noting that there's a big bias towards there being more specimens in the modern because they're more recently deposited and there's been less time for erosion and other forces to cause their loss. One of the things we note in the fossil record is that there are a number of mass extinctions, five big ones and a number of smaller ones, and our geological ages are largely named by those losses. Uh, so one thing that can cause extinction is climate change, and some of those in the Paleozoic were caused uh, by uh, climate change, uh, where at the end of the Cambrian, the Orchidovician, and Carboniferous, uh, large losses were probably caused by that. Uh, so we can use uh, isotopes of oxygen, uh, as well as some other isotopes, to help uh, give us a sense of what taxonomic diversity was like in the past. Uh, so in the Mesozoic, the age of the, the dinosaurs, uh, temperatures were generally quite a bit higher and there tended to be more richness then. We happen to be, despite recent global warming, in the midst of a long-running cold spell on the Earth and that likely uh, contributes part of the species loss we currently observe, although human activities are also a major component of current extinctions. All right, so this is inherently a challenging field and even statistical uh, analyses are ultimately limited in what they can do to make up for the fact only some things are fossilized. All right, so one concept I really want to push home, we'll talk about this more in our last class, is an adaptive radiation. This is when there are more new species forming than losses. A number of our best studied Adaptive radiations are on islands, for example, on Hawaii, where silver sword birds, featured here on screen left, or silver sword plants, uh, featured on the right, which go from being shrubs uh, to annual herbs to trees all across Hawaii with a variety of flower forms depending on, and leaf forms depending on the habitat in which they're in. They've both diversified very recently. The Hawaiian islands are only about 5 million years old. Other radiations have occurred in habitats that are sort of like islands, such as in the great African Rift Valley lakes, like Lake Tanganyika and Malawi and Victoria, where you see similar fishes in similar habitats, but they've formed uh, convergently, uh, so that in the same habitat in a different lake, you'll see a similar looking fish, but they're actually within a lake all more closely related to each other than between lakes. The lakes were colonized only once or twice by these cichlid uh, African fishes. So your book has some nice tables on uh, radiations. Often there's a key innovation that underlies the radiation, some trait that predisposes the group to take on a variety of uh, different forms. Uh, in some cases, particularly on islands, uh, there's a they're simply the lucky ones that got there. In the case of, say, insects, it's because they developed wings and were able to colonize the air. So across many of these adaptive radiations, there's some exploitation of environments that aren't occupied by competitors. This may be an empty oceanic island or an empty lake, but if uh, animals come or plants come up with a new adaptation, uh, it may simply be that they're creating new habitats or new niches uh, that previously did not exist. And these can transform how organisms interact with the environment. So one of these uh, adaptive radiations, the first is the Cambrian explosion, where we start to see all these new forms of animals occurring in the shallow seas of the Cambrian era. And most of the forms of animals we know now arose then as well as a great number that we've lost. Uh, so some of these uh, transitions are well documented in the fossil record. 
And some of them, these changes that we've observed in organisms uh, track changes in environments. So as oxygen became more abundant in the atmosphere due to photosynthesis starting about 2 billion years ago, you start to see multicellular eukaryotic animals that are able to use that oxygen arising and at first in the shallow seas of the Cambrian era uh, where there were uh, a variety of new habitats uh, that a variety of animals uh, helped to create. All right, so some of the, the developmental in innovations, the, these key innovations that underlie the Cambrian explosion are likely played a role in that adaptive radiation, sort of new animals uh, creating niches for other new animals. All right, so the flip side of an adaptive radiation is an extinction. And we are unfortunately witness to a great number of extinctions. There are historical ones, such as the dodo or the Carolina parakeet, uh, that are in the historical record, but we've recent we've witnessed recent ones such as the northern white rhino uh, that have gone extinct in just the last in the extinct in the wild in just the last few years. So we usually distinguish background extinction, sort of a normal rate of loss of uh, taxa in the fossil record, from mass extinction events when a great number of species go extinct within a few million years in the geological record. And our recent extinctions qualify as one, because even though they, they happen over time, uh, if we use the geological standard uh, of millions of years, we're observing a great many now. But extinction is, is not unusual. It is a common event, and ultimately all life forms will go extinct um, and be replaced by others. So the fossil record has five large extinction events in the or Orcadovician, uh, in the uh, Devonian, at the end of the Permian, at the end of the Triassic, uh, in the middle of the Mesozoic, and the Cretaceous, or the KT event, and that was the end of the dinosaurs. Of these, really the largest is the Permian extinction. Uh, so your book uh, summarizes some of these events and their causes. Uh, some are climate change uh, due to the movement of continents around the world that changes patterns of uh, oceanic circulation and thus uh, temperatures across the planet. The Permian event is likely caused by uh, volcanism in Siberia, leading to global warming and uh, nasty gases in the atmosphere. The KT event, the Cretaceous event, is uh, a meteor strike. Um, and there's good evidence that it was, in fact, a meteor strike with um, uh, elements like iridium that are only found uh, outside of the Earth in high abundance in layers from the KT boundary and a um, actual crater in the Yucatan uh, that we can date to that time. Uh, so there, there are still impacts of that uh, meteor strike on the Mexican coast in the Yucatan Peninsula. And the, so these different causes of different extinction events are noteworthy. Uh, there are all sorts of things can happen. And this leads us into what we're observing today, where it looks like a single organism. Humans are a major driver of extinction worldwide, where the habitat changes that we've wreaked across the planet, such as deforesting Borneo, have widespread effects on other species, such as the orangutans, that rely on rainforests in uh, Borneo and other parts of Southeast Asia. So if we model extinction events over the past uh, two to five million years, it's clear that there are elevated extinctions compared to the fossil record, uh, orders of magnitude greater. And if we model those we might expect given current rates of habitat alteration and climate change, we're in for a doozy of a mass extinction. Now, a particular driver, and we can't have a class without emphasizing this, is global warming, rising carbon dioxide levels, heating the planet, and changing the chemistry of the ocean. So acidifying the ocean is a major threat to all calcium-building uh, marine organisms. Uh, the rising acidity of ocean waters due to carbon dioxide being uh, converted into carbonic acid in the ocean will likely lead to the destruction of coral reefs and the millions of fish, algae, and other 
uh, marine organisms that rely on them. Uh, we're, we're facing a, a particular catastrophic decline in the ocean. It's coral reefs that house most marine biodiversity. So a single extinction event may be of minimal impact, but those of key organisms, either sort of foundation species that create habitats, things like coral, corals that build coral reefs, can have massive cascading effects. And the loss of coral reefs may be the single most uh, destructive uh, event resulting from global warming. And that decline in marine productivity, that change in the photosynthetic capacity of the ocean, may have a number of cascading effects on the rest of us, uh, including its effect on marine fisheries and the some 70% of animal protein that comes from fish in human diets. All right, with that, I'd like to stop. We're going to continue the subject of extinction in class.